Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Slow Art Friday. My name is Christy McMillan, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. I'm joined by Hank Bovey and Joey Gelati, two of our touring docents, and they are going to lead us through our program today. Each Friday at 12, the docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Hank and Joey will lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork. Hank and Joey will allow us time to look at each work on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Hank, Joey, myself, and each other throughout the hour. Just a few notes uh, before we get started. You notice that your microphones and video were muted by default. Um, at any time, you are more than welcome to turn on your video so that we can see you today. And in just a few moments, I'll make it so that you can unmute your microphone as well. If you do um, choose to have your video on, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong light source. Um, choose a quiet room and close the door. Silence any alerts from nearby devices as they can be very distracting during the program. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. While you can log in using a smartphone, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name so that we know who you're talking to. Throughout the program, to ask questions or make comments, you can unmute your microphone when Hank and Joey ask for questions or comments. You can also type any questions or comments into the chat box. A third way to participate is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar and Hank or Joey will call on you and unmute your microphone. Finally, we are recording, so if you prefer not to be recorded, please make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit questions and comments. Before we get started, does anybody have any questions? Okay, Hank and Joey, what are we going to be talking about today? Hi, this is Joey Gelati. Um, we're going to be talking about works on paper. And before we begin, I just want to tell you what my inspiration for today was in this uh, theme of works on paper. And it was my uh, first visit back to the museum in September when it reopened. Uh, and my usual routine with museum visits is to go and look at some of my favorite artwork. I went up to the SEC, SECU gallery and I noticed there were numerous changes in the gallery. The work, the artwork seemed a little more spread out and I assume that's to accommodate social distancing. But then some of my faves, which were works on paper, had been rotated out of the collection. <clears throat> For those of you that may not know why the museum does that is that works on paper like watercolors, prints, photographs are are fragile and highly susceptible to light, changes in temperature and humidity, and, and those things can cause the paper to fade or the medium uh, to yellow. So um, it's a routine task of the museum to, to rotate these works out to, to conserve them so they have a lo longer lifetime. Um, on the bright side, it's nice to have new uh, works come into the museum for display. So it's very exciting to see what else the museum has in their collection. Um, on the downside, it takes some work to do that. I mean, not only does the work have to be prepared for display and uh, a label written, um, the work has to really relate to and spark conversation with artwork around it. So I think it's rather tricky business. And um, I think the museum did a great job of, of rotating the art this, this six months. Anyway, we're going to start uh, today by discussing three works on paper. They're all roughly the same age, and only one is currently hanging in the SECU galleries. So let's have the first slide. Let's take a few seconds to really examine closely this painting. <clears throat> so 
What's going on in this painting? What do you see? It's abstract to me, but I see a house or some buildings or structures, and then I'm drawn to all of the um, the trees and the the foliage along the bottom, and I like the colors. Great. So you you see a building, you see trees, foliage. Um, do you want to venture to guess what what this is a painting of? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Okay. Any... I, I see it as a barn, um, as a, a rural setting, maybe farm-like, um, but a pink barn is interesting. So, so Barbara's commenting on, on the fact that she sees a barn and and the colors that the artists use are very interesting. It's not, I don't think, typical of what you might see a barn painted pink. Are there, what else can we see in this painting? One thing I'm seeing is, um, is, well, it's probably because it's fall here. So I'm seeing that the trees on the left, I'm seeing trees on the left, um, two trees, and it looks kind of like the leaves are changing and a lot of them have already fallen off. And yet on the right and that strip down below look, um, oh, and the bushes along the left look in full bloom. So you're, uh, Judy's thinking maybe this is fall. Um, I don't know, I think it's, I think it's not, but I think it, contradicts itself a little bit. So there's some con contradictory elements in this painting. Some leaves look like they may be fall colors, but yet there's there could be evergreens or other green foliage that might lead you to believe this is spring or summertime. Is there anything about the light source here that helps us identify the time of day or the season of the year? In the comments, Joey Gale has commented that she also sees a barn but the, uh, she thinks there's a beautiful sunset reflecting on the side. So um, Gail sees perhaps th this is evening and sunset and perhaps because there's some yellow, I see some yellow on the side of the barn there. So maybe that is what's uh, indication that it may be sunset. The sky is also kind of pink. So maybe uh, that's also an indication of the sunset. Anything else? I'm almost seeing multiple seasons and multiple times of day, if that makes any sense. I, I, I can see spring, summer, fall. I, I can see sun. I can see the pinkish sky. And um, the, the lines on the barn are interesting, too. The, the vertical lines and the roof lines. And it almost looks like a couple of chimneys there. Yeah, I, I but, agree. I, I agree that there are, I, I like that instead of the idea of contradictory, seeing contradictory seasons, um, that, that many things are combined, many seasons are combined. And because, you know, the problem with it being sunset is that there are, well, that might be one shadow, but I don't really see many shadows that are sticking out. So it looks like it would be noon. When okay. there no Judy thinks it might be a different time of day. Um, Gail thought it might be sunset. I, I think someone said the light source may be coming from the left side. And I think you could see on, on the trees, there, there is a light side and a dark side. So that in some parts of the barn, there's some shadow. So maybe, you know, the light is coming from the left. Um, what can you say about the shapes in this painting or the style of this painting? I think it, it's got a cubist kind of um, influence to me, sort of. And Jay, yes. what, what do you see that makes you say cubist? Well, I think all the different angles and their, you know, their impositions on the elements around them. Okay, I can, I can see definitely a cubist quality here. <laughs> Any other styles that people see in this painting?
Jerry, could you repeat the question? I didn't quite catch it. Uh, do you see any other? Can you talk about the, the style anymore? What style of painting this is or the composition? And on the composition, one thing that's kind of caught my eye, and this relates to the color and the style, is there's a lot of diagonal movement in here with the, the roof line of the barn and the shadows on the roof line. The, the trees and the leaves tend to be in a diagonal. But because of the blues and the pink, you know, diagonal usually makes a, a painting very active. Um, but with the blues and the pink, it kind of calms that down. I agree. I, I think these are the blues and pinks are a little unusual for, and especially the hue. It's kind of a, a pastel y hues for, for the uh, barn and the. Well, and Relinda made a good point in the comment. She said the colors seem wholly from the artist's imagination, although informed by reality. Yeah, so I, I think we've all settled that this is probably a barn, but what don't, if this is a barn, what don't we see here? There's no animals. I mean, the, it doesn't look like a, a broken down, rundown barn, and you don't see any animals or wheelbarrows or grain or cows or anything like that. Um, I also like, besides the vertical lines and the lines on the roof, there's a lot of curves in here. On the right, on the trees, the way they're, they're not straight, the way the trees are curved. And even in the front where the orange is and the yellow is where we're talking about sun, there's like a blue line on the edge there and that's all kind of curved. So there's a lot of curves going on. So Laura's pointing out that the curves on the on the trees on the right. There's a lot of diagonals, as Hank said. Um, it's a very interesting composition. Can, can we talk any about what's in the foreground versus the middle ground and the background? It seems like there's three distinct areas in this painting. And, and actually, that's a comment that Gail made. In the, um, it's, she says it feels a bit patchworky, the bottom foreground with what looks like wheat working their way to the orange yellow. She also comments there's no machinery. Back to your question about what's missing. Yeah, so okay, the question is, is it, is it an active barn or is it you know, a, a deserted barn? Well, it's really striking, I think, that there are no humans. There's so much energy um, and it's impressionistic as Rolinda said in the chat. And she also said, um, uh, we appear to be viewing the scene through a window. And I thought, I find that really interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but that lower swath of blue that has the pattern of leaves and grass in it could be um, fabric. Or even if it's not fabric, it's patterned to look sort of like fabric or a rug or something like that, that, that you're laughing, Joey, you're laughing. No, I'm not because, you know, I didn't think about that, but Gail said it was like a patchwork. You said it's like fabric. So, you know, that very well could be. It could, it does look like fabric. It kind of enters us. It kind of brings us into this picture where there are no humans and the only entries into the barn are black spaces. So um, where Linda said the lines on the left side of the image appear to be a, a window frame. Uh -huh. so very well could be. How about the, the, I mean, where does your eye get drawn in this painting? What, what about the perspective? So we could be standing at a window looking out or we're in the foreground. Where does your eye go in this painting? My eye goes directly to that black um, square, the rectangle that looks like it could be a door maybe. And then the red tree to the right or the red um, lines. Yeah, so yeah. Jay is saying she's drawn to the, the black opening in the barn side and the red tree. And I think red is a little unusual as a color to to paint a tree, but I think it works in this painting. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, so something that um, Judy just said about the, uh, the, you know, the pattern up front, the green 
fabric looking type pattern. Is this something that Matisse, I wonder, would have had a, a landscape or a picture like this with a lot of patterns and color and I just thought of that when she said it was, it could be a tablecloth or, a, you know, looking out a window. Well, I, you know, to what you say, I think this, this has a lot of, you know, um, modern impressionistic qualities to it. And, and perhaps that's what uh, the artist is trying to um, capture here or imitate. Yeah, after Laurel said that she saw all seasons in it, I started seeing all sorts, all artists. <laughs> it's like, you know, like the the sort of curves of Van Gogh and the and the Matisse, like um, separated areas, kind of decorated, and on the left, and that little bush, sort of a pointless thing going on, and then Cezanne's borders. You know, like on the barn, there are red lines that outline the geometric shapes there. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, things that remind us of other artists, famous artists, like Cezanne and Matisse. Are, are there any other um, things people want to say about this painting? But it also looks really quick. Um, I would think that if you were intentionally trying to incorporate, um, you know, styles or influences of other artists, that, that it would be really carefully done. But, you know, you can really see um, sort of quick touches, like, for example, in the leaves, you know, these sort of indications of leaves or movement that look like they're quickly done. Um, or branches from the trees, you know, they're a very light touch. It seems to me like this was something that was, you know, maybe the work of an afternoon um, rather than the work of months and months, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the, it is very, it's a very modern, the way he paints the leaves is it's kind of a very modern effect that he, he does to get, capture the leaves, but still, you know, they're leaves. I see a fence sort of in the foreground um, with the purple and the blue on the left and then going straight across to where that orangey mountains. It looks like I see a fence there. And with the colors, not only are there different colors, but there are different shades of the same color, which is uh, very interesting. Is this one currently the one in the museum? You had mentioned that one of the three. No, it's not. It's no. not currently hanging. Okay. You mentioned that, you know, it is an interesting, there is a distinct foreground here, either it's a windowsill or a, a hill, and there's a middle ground there. I'm not sure what that is. But, and then the background is, you know, the, the, the barn and the sky. So I, I see three distinct um, pieces of this composition. Any other comments? <laughs> One thing I noticed after Christy's comment about how it looked like it possibly was quickly done is the barn and the structures have a bit more detail with the lines and the roof and, and so on. But then the, the tree limbs, especially like off of the red tree, you know, those brown limbs are just, look like just a quick stroke. So there's kind of a difference there in, you know, like the, he, the artist had paid so much more attention to detail, say in the barn and even in the the ground next to the, the fence that that, uh, that Laurie saw. Um, but then those tree branches are just quick and primitive. I, 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 yes, I, I think there's a lot of, I mean, you can see the brush strokes here and I think that that's important. I mean, there's there's a painterly quality to this that you don't, you don't find maybe in, you know, artwork from an earlier period of time, so. Um. I feel two different moods of this painting. Um, the color and the technique seems very energetic to me, but the content, the scene, that moment uh, in a, in a, in a um, on a farm in which there's no movement, that there are no humans, that there is no machinery, no animals. And that does happen, um, but it's rare. And it's two different moods to me. 
That's wonderful, Barbara. I think there's a lot of contradictions in this painting. There's there's that excitement about the the color of the paint and the brushwork, but that but yet there's that stillness that you find in some country scenes, and you could probably find scenes like this right around Asheville. So Jay says it's very serene. So yes, I agree. Any other uh, comments about? the painting before we see its title. I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this um, is a painting by an artist, Pierre Dora. It's uh, around, painted around 1950, so it's about 70 years old. It's tempera on paper. Um, and it was gifted to the museum by um, Pierre's daughter, Martha. Uh, for those of you that don't know anything about Pierre Dura, he's, he's more well known in Europe than he is in the United States. He was born in Spain in 1896. He grew up in Barcelona. He went to the School of Fine Arts in Barcelona. Uh, his art teacher was Pablo Picasso's father. Um, his father, his own father was a musician and he was friends with Pablo Casals, which helped him gain entry into the art world in Paris. As a, a young man, he moved to Paris to study art and was very involved with the avant-garde scene in, in Paris during the 20s. There he met his wife, who was also uh, a painter. She was American. Her name was um, Blair, Claire, I think, Claire Blair. Um, uh, they got married in the late 20s. They had a child, Martha. Um, they moved from Paris because of their daughter, they moved to a little village called uh, Saint-Cirque-la-Popie, which is a beautiful little village in the south of France where they establish a house, uh, household. In the 30s, um, there was the civil war started in Spain and Pierre um, joined the forces of the uh, Republican militia and he fought against the, uh, the fascist regime of Franco. He was severely injured in that, uh, in that war. Um, he never went back to Spain and his citizenship as well as his daughter's citizenship was revoked by Franco at the time. Toward the end of the 30s, he came back to the United States to visit his wife's family who lives in Virginia. Um, and then World War II started and he, they couldn't go back to France until after the war. Um, and, What's interesting about that is I think place for this artist is very important, not only you know, geographically um, and physically, but also emotionally and psychologically. So um, the, all the contradictions in this painting, I think you know, uh, bear on his, his uh, thinking about where he came from um, and where he lived and how important you know, place and family was to him. Okay, the, some of the influences uh, of, that I've seen written about Pierre were uh, Paul Cezanne. Uh, and I, I invite anyone when they have time to look on the internet and pull some of Paul Cezanne's landscape paintings from the turn of the century up. And if you look at some of them like uh, his, he, he did repeating, repeated paintings of uh, a landscape of Mount St. Victoire, which is a, you know, a picture of a mountain in the background, a valley in the midground, and a hilltop in the foreground. And if you superimpose this painting on top of that painting, I think you would see remarkable similarities be between the two and just his style in general. His other um, influences were cave paintings uh, in the Mediterranean region. He comes from um, Barcelona, which is the Catalonia region of Spain. And that, that region of Spain is known for its cave paintings. As a matter of fact, there's more cave paintings there than anywhere else in the Mediterranean basin. Could you go to the next slide, please? So here's just for interest is a picture of a postage stamp about 1967 from Spain. And you can see it's a, a primitive painting of a wild boar hunt. So I think in, in terms of this painting, we talked about the style he used, which was you know, kind of impressionistic, cubistic, even primitive. His use of colors with red especially was, was a color used in that painting a lot. So I think he was definitely influenced by 
uh, cave paintings in his region. He probably went to see them as a, as a, young, a young man where he grew up. I think we're ready to, to turn it over to Hank and the next pic picture. All right, I think you all know the routine and welcome to um, a Sorry Friday for me. But now let's take a few moments and look at this um, piece of art and then we'll talk about it. All right, let's, um, who wants to go first? What is going on in this artwork? I see the plus and the equal signs. I don't know what the things in the middle are exactly, but the plus and the blue, yes, the equal signs stand out to me. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the other thing is. Is it an elephant? It's very abstract to me and I, I can't come up with it definitive object. So with, with that said, and definitely it's an abstract, um, but curious with that plus and the equals, and either you or anybody else have some thoughts on what might be going on there. Okay. So in the chat, sorry, Jay, um, Gail says that she sees an elephant with an upturned trunk on a keychain. <laughs> I love that. Um, the elephant has a mahjong tile on its back. <laughs> and I didn't see that until I read that comment. So that's great. I, I too am having a hard time getting past my projection of <laughs> an elephant or an animal or a burden on the back of a beast or it's really hard for me to see this as you know to get past my own image ideas um and i kind of like the that the plus and the equals all, all also those mean something to me you know it's a plus sign there are two equal signs and i and i it's frust this is frustrating i love this work but it's frustrating for me because, you know, they might just be two blue lines on the upper left corner and two blue lines on the bottom corner for balance or something. You know, I want to see it as something more than what my brain automatically goes to, which is, you know, familiar symbols. Yeah, yeah. The seven red in the, I don't know, whatever that part, yeah. They almost look like they could be human people playing flutes or instruments or something. It, it, it's kind of, and then you've got the three blue ones over here by what could be part of the elephant. Yeah, I don't know what the symbolic meaning is, but I notice it. So they, those seven red splotches, we'll call them. Some of them do have very much a, a figurative look to them to me as well. So I can see that. And in the chats, um, Relinda says, the artist seems to be pouring his or her thoughts or emotions onto the paper. So if you think about it that way, um, and I, I hear what you're saying, Judy, as far as you're kind of stuck on this looking like an elephant now, but if you kind of rethink that as, as the artist pouring his or her thoughts or emotions onto the paper, do we see anything different? I see like an abstract picture of a tabletop from uh, viewed from above, maybe with a vase of flowers, which are the red blotches and the legs of the table, you know, a little skewed underneath them. Um, so I thought it could be a table or a chair, I mean, or an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I guess somebody doesn't agree with me. <laughs> At least it wasn't mine, so um, but I can see that. So, Joy, what you're saying is we're kind of an aerial view of a tabletop. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting to think about it as a still life, I think, but thinking about it as what Hank, what you what you asked, you know, if this was if this was the artist, you know, energetically expressing paint or expressing, I don't know, maybe feelings, but you know, expressing himself. Um, that makes me look at shapes and lines 
And I think it's the, I, and the shape above, the red shape above with the splotches in it is its own thing. And then there's this other shape that's like a brain or, <laughs> or like a, some organ or almost a, like a squished circle. Yeah. And then there are the two shapes below that are U shapes. And the one on the left, it looks like he went over several times. It's, he outlined it in black and then, and then also in blue and then also in white. So I guess when I, you know, looking at it as the artist expressing himself on the paper, um, I can see the strokes, you know, that makes me kind of see the squiggle in the left upper and just these sort of sudden marks, which I like a lot better than, um, you know, finding figures and animals in it, which is sort of a dead end. And I suspect the artist is on the same page with you there, but we don't know. Um, but I also in the comments, um, Rolanda says, seems to have been executed rapidly with great energy, um, as if the artist could get his feelings out fast enough. So Rolanda, can you comment on what, what gives you that feeling of energy? Uh, hi, Hank. Yes, um, I, I think the, the brush strokes certainly I think the um, splotches of color at the top, to me, that almost seems to have a, an angry feeling to it, um, partly because of the color and partly because of the way that it appears on the paper. Um, and, and then the fact that we've got mostly fluid, organic lines going through it. Um, it, it just seems like somebody it was there you know, quickly trying to put down what they were feeling at the moment. So and what I'm hearing more of now that we start to look at it a bit more is that we're starting to see more feelings rather than actual figures or, or anything representational. Um, but why also, they, go ahead. Why do they have to be feelings? Why, why not just an expression of the painter painting. And that could well be. Exactly. So good point. And a couple of comments. The circle that Judy just pointed out is transparent on the top, but not so much on the bottom. And then uh, someone says some areas seem angry, others more thoughtful. And I think that kind of goes along with the earlier comment about the, uh, the curvy a line at the bottom where there's the black and then the white, that sort of seems to be more than one mood, so to speak. Um, and Jay asks, I wonder when and where the painting was executed. City, time of day, what influenced the painter? Um, based on the date, this artist, um, and we'll get into that at the end, spent time in both Germany and the United States. This was painted in 1948, which would have been after he immigrated. And he primarily was in New York City in Provincetown, Massachusetts. I don't know for sure that this was painted in one of those locations, but it's a possibility. Time of day, I don't know. I, I would like to comment on the, the translucence uh, of the paint. It looks in some areas it's rather opaque. And then in other areas, you can see through the paint to the uh, paper underneath it, perhaps, or maybe another layer of paint. I think that's interesting in the brushwork here. So I was noticing the same thing, Joey. I mean, it's very, very layered to me. And and Judy, you pointed this out too, is you can see through the the paint layers to, you know, thoughts that the artist had had before, you know, the final iteration of what we're seeing. Um, with the outlines, but also with the layering of colors or brush strokes or you know, things putting, you know, you can see here, and I don't know, may, I, I know that my screen is probably the sharpest, but you can even see underneath here um, some lines and some colors that were then painted over. There's just so many layers to it. And I, I guess going back to what somebody uh, was talking, I think it was you, Rolinda and Jay, talking about sort of emotions and feelings, I kind of see them as messy and complicated and layered and sometimes contradictory and and things showing through. Um, 
you know, not necessarily as clean and orderly and um, predictable. And I, I agree with you, Christy, on the, the messy part. Definitely, it's it does kind of have a, a whole mix. If you know, if we're thinking that this might represent moods, and it might might not. That yeah, it is that they're they're complicated and messy. So, what else do we see? You know, I'm just looking at it now, and I'm seeing is that one circle uh, an artist's palette, and is the the big circle his pa uh, the, the person's painting, and are those two legs his his legs? I don't know, just all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe it's someone standing over a painting with a palette. I saw the palette too, almost right away. Um, I don't think I've ever spent this much time looking at this painting, um, but yeah, I, the a painter's palette is a very distinct shape and I definitely um, have been seeing that um, in that shape of a palette, which as a painter, he would certainly know well. I can see that, the, the whole pile of that at the top and the legs at the bottom. And I also see it on the left side, about two thirds of the way up from the bottom, I almost see a female figure with the black hair and a face in the middle, you know, sort of leaning towards the left side. Yeah, there. So what else do we see? There's definitely a lot of intersecting lines, sort of like a geometric type where all of the, 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 the circle lines and the lines on the bottom, plus the little piece of green in that one circle is interesting because it's just that little, one little piece of green there. So, uh, I think it's wonderful. interesting also, speaking of colors that he's using like primary colors here, red, I mean, they're not all that he's using, but the red, the blue and the yellow. Um, which kind of surround this object, whatever it is. So, anybody else? Yeah, I, I following on what Joey said, um, the colors are really important in this. I mean, I don't make any particular meaning out of them, but the fact that there are both um, curves and divisions of objects and um, sort of mathematical symbols or geometric, you know, straight and curved lines and all these colors, uh, it just enlivens, all of that enlivens this so much. To what L Laurel said, you know, um, about the green, you've got a plus sign, yellow plus blue equals green. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> That that what do you know? It just occurred to me when she said green. But Besides like the, the, the plus sign and the equal sign, I'm also noticing this is sort of like a mathematical bracket, and this is a minus sign as well, um, in addition to the ones that were more readily identifiable as mathematical. These are also symbols that we use in math. Wow. Kind of going back to the colors, um, they almost have a chronological sense to them. Like you talked about all the different layers being built up. And even this yellow uh, where the plus sign is and where that mathematical bracket may be. And then the, the stroke at the very bottom, you can see that that paintbrush has a, a amount of yellow and white on the paintbrush. And it looks like they were kind of a plot like those brush strokes all feel like they happened in the same time period where that yellow, it looks like the signature at the bottom, looks like that was done maybe with a different paint brush and just with the yellow. But then the blue and white, uh, the plus signs, they feel like they happened at the same time and that the yellow dots happened at the same time as the yellow. So it, that's where I kind of feel like there's a chronologicalness to how the colors are applied. Definitely. I, I can see that, especially with, when you pointed out the what we think might be the signature there at the bottom, even though it's yellow, you can see it's, it's different. So likely was applied at a different time. So anybody else? Well, with that said then, Christy, let's go ahead and move to the title slide. 
and this is untitled, Hans Hoffman, 1948. And with the, and it's 7 by 14, notice it's gouache on gray paper. If, I don't know if you noticed or not, but the previous work that Joey talked about was tempera. Uh, was um, tempera. I think that's kind of interesting that, you know, they're using, you know, medium precise oil painting, which, you know, is part of, the, of contemporary art is exploring different materials. I actually thought the tempera was very interesting because that's basically finger paint. And if you've ever worked with that, it's very easy to turn your work into just a gray bunch of muck. So, um, so interesting that he used that. It's interesting here that the guy used gouache, which is a little bit more permanent than, than tempera. So um, regarding um, our artist here, he was, as I mentioned, um, German, originally born 1880 in Germany, emigrated in uh, 1932. And he was a teacher and had an art school both in Germany and also once he immigrated to the United States, he um, reopened his art school both in New York City and in Provincetown. And it was actually considered the first art school to teach modern art. Um, he was considered an expert on um, symbolism, neo-impressionism, fauvism, and cubism. And I think if you look at this work, you can see elements of some of those those in here. Um, his work is characterized by a rigorous concern for pictorial structural unity, spatial illumination, and bold use of color. We see all that here. He's also considered um, one of the uh, first artists in the abstract expressionist movement. And I think we kind of hit on that early on in the discussion. Actually, I think one of the first comments we were was it's abstract, but also, you know, in the chat and both in your, your vocal comments, you kept talking about, you know, the, ex the expressionist aspects of this as far as, you know, emotion, feelings, what was, you know, going through the artist's head. So um, I think we hit the nail on the head with that. So any last questions or comments? All right, then, Christy, if you want to flip to the next one, I'm going to turn it back to Joey. Okay, let's take a few seconds to uh, study this painting. What are people seeing here? I'm seeing a face and then faces within a face. And I, I initially see like eyes and glasses and a nose and maybe a mustache. And yet within the eyes, I'm also seeing eyes and mouth and, and human features. So Laurel sees a face. Does, are there any other thoughts about what this might be? I kind of see some topography going on where the eyes might be. They almost look like um, old, kind of old fashioned, kind of turn of the century topography. So you're seeing topography in the eyes. Um, Are you seeing typography, like um, print um, letters? Gary. Yes, I'm seeing letters, no, not any specific letters, but um, the the right one looks like an old fashioned kind of um, a sensory C. So it would be a, like pretty calligraphy style. Yeah. Um, yeah, like when I kind of look at it, I would, if I were to pull away some of the pieces there, I could almost, almost find a type letter underneath there, an in initial or something. So you're seeing calligraphy here, which is interesting. Yeah. So it could be a face. It could be some kind of calligraphic um, word. And it feels like it's got multi layers to it, the same way that the paper and the cardboard are kind of acting. You can kind of see there's multi layers. And even where the somebody said it might be two eyes, it feels like that has multi layers to it as well. So Gary's commenting on the fact that it looks like there are um, pieces of paper, brown paper that are glued to a, a background. What, what can we say about the, uh, the surface of, of this? 
It's cardboard. It looks like cardboard on burlap. I know, which is, it's kind of interesting because, you know, cardboard isn't what you would typically think people would, if they're doing something that they want to want to create, they would do something on such a throwaway item as cardboard. Um, and then it's also on, although it's very nice, it looks like a piece of a nice burlap underneath it. So um, there may be a message there, I, I don't know. So in the chat, Rolinda said um, that it seems assembled, that pieces were made separately and then joined together. So it's kind of like a collage, I would, I would say maybe painted at different times and and put together, glued together. What's striking too is in contrast to the other two that we were looking at, the absence of color. I mean, it, this is all black mm -hmm. and this sense of tan, but I don't think if this was colorized, it would have the same feeling. So Laurel's commenting on the, the, the black and white, I would say black and white nature of it is just, um, it makes it very striking and it might not have the same effect if you had other colors. Am I, am I interpreting your comments right, Laura? Yes, correct, yeah. So Rolinda follows up on that and says, the black is just as powerful as the strong colors in the other artworks we've looked at. My initial thought when I looked at it is it looked like a Rorschach test and certainly would be if it was turned on its side. But now the more I look at it, it really does look like a portrait to me. And in the comments earlier, I think um, someone said that at first I thought I saw Truman Capote, but now <laughs> I see eyes, nose, and mustache, a very determined look. Great, so we have a couple of uh, conflicting things here. Someone said it looks like a Rorschach test, and I'm not that familiar with you know, psychoanalysis, but usually those are, you know, ink blot tests where, you know, they're symmetrical on both sides. And I, this has some symmetry to it. So I, I can really understand, I can see that. Um, and on the other hand, I think a lot of people have established that it, it is a face or eyes, nose, and a mustache, at least. So this morning on my way to work, um, there was a story on NPR about Bob Ross and his beginnings. And so I've got, you know, happy little trees in my mind right now and the way that he very quickly <laughs> sketched in mountains. And Gary, you you said typography, but I thought you said topography. And I think because I was thinking about Bob Ross, I kept looking at this that, you know, some people have said is a mustache and I saw that as like a mountain range. <laughs> so I think what we uh, we're thinking about that day maybe influences what we're seeing in something and and the things that other people might see can turn our eyes on to something else. Do you, do you think that the material the artists use, you know, the cardboard and the burlap in, enhances this picture or detracts from it? I think it enhances it because um, it brings a dimensionality to it, which actually the layering already does and the way that the strokes are applied um, already do. But then to layer it on top of another layer of cardboard, which adds a little bit of mystery about what's underneath there. You can see one, um, you know, in the bottom where the supposed mountain mustache is, um, there's a line kind of sticking out, you know? So I wonder what's under there. I can't see what's under there. So it adds some sort of intrigue to the face and um, to the portrait. And then to put it on top of burlap or linen, um, I, I, think, I think it's they're good choices because they add texture um, to contrast with the black lines, the stroke but they don't add color or anything distracting so that it really makes the, the portrait stand out. The features of the face stand out. Yeah, yeah, back to what Judy said about the, the layers there, you know, I think that also might uh, give us the thought that 
th there's a complexity here, whether it's a landscape or a face or, or, or text, calligraphy that, you know, what you see on the surface may not be all there is to it. And we get a little peek of that by what could be the mountain or the mustache, where we see that little bit peeking out to tell us that, you know, there's more to it than what's on the surface. It also feels a little impulsive as well. You know, like there's um, the artist is using, you know, found objects. You know, the cardboard is pretty accessible. I imagine back in the, I'm not sure when this piece was done, but cardboard was probably still very accessible. Brown paper bags, super accessible. So it's kind of like he's created the artwork or the marks on brown paper and then has cut them out and assembled them and kind of glue them together and kind of gone with what was created and even blocking over bits, but not carefully, like there's no real precision to it. It's not like having to get a canvas out and priming it up and then starting your artwork. You've got these pieces like right in front of you. So that's where I feel like there's a, a little bit of impulsiveness, just energetic creativity, and then using what you've got to assemble something together. Yep. Yes, there's a Gary, there's a real immediacy to this. He's done it on the spot with what was available. And um, the, the artist did a remarkable job of depicting, I think, you know, a, a, a portrait maybe here. I'm almost the, saying, it, oh, go ahead. I, sorry, um, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. It's no. kind of like they didn't have to run off to the art store to get any supplies. Like there's that to it like there's so many times I've wanted to do something and I'm like wow oh, I don't have a canvas right now where I'm out of supplies sorry for interrupting you there though no that's okay I I was just gonna say that I almost see a Mona Lisa effect like the eyes keep looking at me no matter which way I kind of look like the eyes are following me so. I agree it's a how does that make you feel Laurel <laughs> like unsettled or no, no, I, I like it. I like it. Yeah. Well, what would you say? I mean, let's let's say that this is a face. What, what words would you use to describe the person being depicted here? There is a friendliness and engagement with them. Like you, they don't feel aggressive, even though it's uh, there's not a lot of description. But it, it, like uh, you said, the, the eyes are, they seem to catch you or they seem to catch your attention they, and they seem to hold. So th there's there's a, an engagement and friendliness with it. I see an intensity. You know, again, what Gary's talking about, about the eyes I may, you know, um, interpret differently, but it's certainly those eyes are, you know, that person's personality, um, what they're giving off, their energy. And I think there's an added challenge not having a mouth. We don't know if this individual might be smiling, yelling, frowning. So it's, you know, we're having to make those assumptions based on just the eyes and, and the mustache. It's kind of the world we live in right now, Hank. <laughs> Very I tell people I'm smiling at you behind my mask in case you don't see. <laughs> yeah, there is an authority to it, I think. Um, because it uh, doesn't have color and the shapes give it an authority and the complexity of, of the shapes make me think that this is a serious person. I, I agree, I, I see a thinker, you know. That, that's... In the chat, um, Rolinda, I think you made a, a really interesting comment because um, we, we didn't really talk a lot about um, sort of the effect of the materials, but you said that the materials eliminate pretension. Um, do you think, um, Rolinda, if, that it's purposely giving us clues about the sitter? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, one could certainly make the argument that it was, as someone else has already mentioned, some the artist grabbing what was closest at hand. But I think that since they seem to be capturing a personality, that they would have felt that that individual would be pleased with and comfortable with having their portrait on cardboard. You know, they're kind of a down to earth kind of a person um, and that they would not be offended to have themselves represented this way. I don't know if that, um, hmm. 
I think making a link between what the artist wanted to capture and anything having to do with what the subject might have thought about it is pretty tenuous. It depends on the relationship between the two, right? Yes, and we don't know what the relationship is because we don't so, know. So if, if you are, um, if you believe to, to my, um, what I was saying about, you know, the artist thinking that the, the sitter would have been comfortable with this would imply um, a close understanding of the subject, but that's not necessarily the case, but that would have been my takeaway. Well, I, I you know, I have the, I have the impression that the artist either knew the subject or had a really strong impression of the subject um, at first sight or, you know, um, in a moment, but that the artist had no, uh, uh, that doesn't imply any, um, any um, comfort or discomfort that the that the subject might have. I mean, this looks like a quick snapshot to me if it were if it were a camera, a photograph, and I can't think of artists even caring about what this whether the subject might be comfortable or offended or not. I mean, I just don't think there's anything in this work to um, point us in that direction. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, several of you have commented, um, like you said, Judy, in the chat about that this feels very immediate or quickly done or urgently done, someone said, um, to be able to, to capture um, the sitter. And Gary, I, um, yeah, it was you. Um, you said that um, maybe some of that layering that, Judy, you mentioned earlier um, was the artist sort of reworking, um, you know, the the eye or the mouth or the mustache or, you know, features of the face. And that way it's like the Hans Hoffman that came before with all of those layers. I mean, all those layers might have been the artist reworking and reworking and continually working to get the final forms that um, he wanted. That could be the case here too. Wow, I have to tell you, I was a little concerned about picking this because I wasn't sure how, how much commentary there would be, but there's a hell of a lot going on here. It's great. I could see a chess player. I think this person's a chess player. Please like a, a furrow heaviness concentration, Laurel, is what you're getting? Yes, yes. Uh, Christy, is it uh, time? I, I think I'm much watching the clock, but let's. <clears throat> so, this painting is by um, an artist named Fielding Dawson. He is more well known as a um, a writer than um, an artist, but he did a lot of art during his career. He was born in 1930 in New York. His family moved to St. Louis. He took um, portrait classes in St. Louis and as a young man went to Black Mountain College um, in 1949. He, he studied with this gentleman who's a portrait here, Charles Olson, who is also a writer, um, a Harvard educated writer who came to Black Mountain College to teach. And he also studied with Franz Klein. And I, th I think you could you know, see some similarities in, in this picture to some of Franz Klein's abstract expressionist artwork. Um, what's also interesting about Fielding Dawson is, is he didn't live a very long life. I think he died in the early 90s, but um, he did, he wrote maybe 22 books. He illustrated a lot of uh, literary journals. And later in life, he started to teach. He's also a teacher like the other two artists. He started to teach creative writing in prisons like Attica and Sing Sing, which must have been very intense. Um, so uh, he was one of the first people to really recognize the, um, the inequity and inequality in our criminal justice system. And I saw an interview of him on television and, and he was really trying to help. He was trying to do his own, in his own little way, help prisoners, both male and female, to develop a skill in, uh, in creative writing. So back to this painting again, it's, uh, let, let's, let's show a picture, the next slide, because this is who, who the, uh, the portrait is of, Charles Olson, who was uh, on the writing faculty and literature faculty of Black Mountain College. 
um, and he eventually became the rec rector. He was a very imposing figure. He was like six foot four, and he was very intense. And I, I don't know if you agree, but I think um, Fielding Dawson uh, really captured the essence of this man in that really quickly um, painted portrait that he did of him. I seem to remember, Joey, um, when we were doing our training on Black Mountain College that he would sometimes give lectures that lasted like 24 hours. <laughs> he was very intense. <laughs> and when La Laurel said, uh, reminded her of a chess player and even this picture by Jonathan Williams, he looks very intense and serious to me. Well, I, you know, I think this last painting really exemplifies the, the spirit of the, the art world coming out of World War II and the, the whole zeitgeist of Black Mountain College. I mean, it's so brash and raw and intense. Um, and, and there's not many, I, and the, what we talked about, the material that was used to paint on. I was trying to look for some of this gentleman's artwork and there's not much that I could find on the internet, but he did do a painting of a Cy Twombly which is striking, you have to look that up. But he did it on butcher paper, butcher, butcher's paper. It's like, like who does that? <laughs> it's very interesting. So I, um, anyway, I thought it captured the whole spirit of Black Mountain College and I'm glad we talked about it today. Yeah, using the materials that were on hand because of course all of the stories that you hear about Black Black Mountain College is this constant lack of money and sort of using using what was at hand um, in order yeah. to make your art. I read somewhere that one of the students there had the duty to go to the dump to take the trash to the dump. And, and they loved to, that duty because they would come back with more stuff than they brought there. So, um, so anyway, I, I think um, to conclude here uh, and Hank, you want to, I don't know if people have any questions about what we saw, if they had a favorite um, piece of artwork that we discussed. Can I just ask you, um, I, I didn't really look at the dates. Were all of these, what, how far apart were these? Just, they're, they're about eight years apart. That last painting was done in 1956. The, um, the barn scene was 1950, and I think the Hans Hoffman was 1948. It's really interesting to look at art that's very close in, in time period to each other. And back to, and the only one that's hanging is the second one, the Hans Hoffman. And I, I haven't had the privilege of seeing the other two, but I, I will say the museum does a terrific job of conserving these paintings. They've only owned the, um, the Hoffman since 2010, but it, it seems to me as a novice to be in pristine condition. Thanks, Joey. Does anybody have any last thoughts or questions? There was a mention on that um, Hans Hoffman, is that his name? Uh, in that Ninth Street uh, women's book that was a recent read that you guys did. That was a mm -hmm. wonderful book. I didn't make it to the discussion, but um, And that was pre-recording day, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was very good though. Well, um, Fielding Dawson and Hans Hoffman and all those people were in the downtown New York art scene. They, they hung out at the Cedar Bar and, and they all knew each other. So. All right. Well, thank you, Joey. And thank you, Hank, for leading this uh, discussion today about these three works on paper. I, I also really appreciated that the three works that you chose were all different media. Um, we had um, the ink on paper as well as the temper on paper and gouache on paper. Um, usually when I think of works on paper, for whatever reason, I think of prints and photographs and you gave us something completely um, out, outside of what I was expecting today. So thank you very much for um, choosing these three beautiful artworks. Next Friday, uh, Friday the 20th, uh, our topic is We Gather Together. Um, and Kay Dunn, one of our touring docents, is going to uh, lead a, a discussion about three works in the collection that all look very different uh, and are in different media, um, but all um, challenge our ideas of uh, 
traditional Thanksgiving. And I think it's a wonderful topic, very timely, and will be a really good discussion. So if you would like to join us uh, next Friday, please head over to our website and get registered. As always, I'll send you a quick evaluation uh, today once we sign off. Thank you guys for joining us. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, take care.